What's up everyone, I'm Wayne Grayson and you're watching Equipment World. It's Monday, June 22nd and it's time for another episode of The Dirt, the weekly construction and heavy equipment news show. Coming up today on The Dirt, we're gonna discuss a pretty interesting report coming out of Korea about the possible but not quite nearly a total sale of Doosan's construction equipment division. Pretty big news. Uh, plus, we'll also talk with Dennis Howard. He is the vice president of dealer RDO Equipment. And we're going to talk with Dennis a little bit about the health of the construction industry and also what he's seeing in terms of demand for heavy equipment. But first, let's get into the week's top story, starting with new details from OSHA on what the agency says are the leading causes for trench violations in construction. So of all the safety citations that OSHA hands out on a yearly basis, the agency says says that excavation related violations are the sixth largest type. And in a new release from the agency, they say that the leading cause for those excavation related violations is failing to provide proper trench protection. In fact, between October 2018 and September 2019, OSHA says that it handed out 805 serious level citations for failure to provide proper trench protection. Now in that 12 month time frame, the agency says that in total, it handed out 1,173 serious excavation related citations. And behind failure to provide proper protection, protection, the other leading causes of those serious level excavation citations that OSHA issued were failure to provide a ladder or another means of entering and exiting a trench and placing spoil too close to the trench and thereby endangering workers inside of falling rock and soil. Now, as for why these contractors still aren't following proper trench safety protocols, OSHA says that the biggest excuse that it hears from them are trying to stay on schedule. Other reasons these contractors have given OSHA as for why they're not following the proper protocols include not being educated, simply just not understanding what to do to be safe, tight budgets, in other words, the trench protection and the time involved being too costly to the operation, and finally, various language barriers between supervisors and employees. Since 2018, OSHA has really stepped up the amount of inspections that it's performing on job sites related to trench safety. That increase in inspections was aimed at remedying a spike that the agency saw in the average number of trench deaths per year, which rose from 17 between 2012 and 2014, all the way to 29 between 2015 and 2017. The good news is that OSHA says that following this increase in inspections, that number of trench deaths fell from that average of 29 between 2015 and 2017 back to 17 in 2018. Next up in this week's top stories, Ford says its answer to the exploding electric pickup market will be ready in the next 24 months. Ford's chief operating officer, Jim Farley, made this announcement during a recent interview with CNBC, and it's actually the first time since the automaker even confirmed that it was working on a battery-powered F-150 that it has decided discussed a time frame for that truck's release. And while acknowledging quickly mounting competition in the electric pickup space during this interview with CNBC, Farley was pretty quick to draw a line in the sand with regard to Tesla. Tesla, of course, is the company that is behind a fairly popular lineup of electric vehicles, and specifically, it's the company behind the upcoming Cybertruck. And while Tesla has certainly risen very quickly in the auto industry to the point where it is a highly desired brand among all companies, among the likes of, say, like Apple, Farley says Ford is betting that it's not too far behind Tesla in the race for electrification due to its legacy. In that interview with CNBC, Farley called Ford, quote, a brand people trust, end quote. With longtime rival General Motors having announced an electric pickup of its own in the pipeline for 2021, that is the revamped Hummer that will be, for some reason, under the GMC badge and a pickup only this time around. Along with all of these new electrified upstarts like Tesla and Nikola and Rivian and Bollinger, all announcing electric pickups and all unveiling their designs before really GM and Ford have gotten off the starting block with unveiling their own designs. Uh, presumably all of those trucks will hit the market before. But all of that to say, the electric pickup truck market is exploding in a very profound way. So it was important for Ford to get out and actually announce a time frame for that F-150 because the F-150 is everyone knows has been the most popular vehicle in the US for you know nearly five decades. And if they wanna keep that momentum going into the electrified era of vehicles, they'll have to deliver the goods in the face of a lot of competition. And all of that is happening despite the fact that none of these trucks are currently available on the market today. In other news, actually related to the automotive industry, Volvo Group, the parent company of not only Volvo automobiles, but also Volvo construction equipment and Mack trucks, 
has announced that it is slashing 4,100 employees from its global workforce due to impacts on its business from the coronavirus pandemic. About 1,250 of those cut positions are actually located in Volvo's home country of Sweden. And Martin Lundstedt, the CEO and president of Volvo Group, had this to say in a statement. The corona epidemic and the global measures taken to fight it has led to a market situation impacting our industry severely, Lundstedt says in the statement. The effects are expected to be lower demand going forward, and we need to continue to adjust our organization accordingly. In parallel, we will accelerate the competence shift needed for new technologies and business models. Rounding out the week's top stories is a surprising report out of South Korea that Doosan is actually considering to sell its construction equipment business, or at least some of its construction equipment business. So let's kind of rewind here. As you're probably already aware, Doosan purchased compact equipment leader Bobcat back in 2007. When they did so, they slotted it under its Doosan Infracore subsidiary. Now that Infracore division was actually formed after Doosan's 2005 acquisition of another heavy equipment maker, and that was Daewoo Heavy Industries and Machinery. And obviously those Daewoo machines became Doosan branded machines. And as of right now, the Doosan Infracore subsidiary consists of Doosan Bobcat, and it consists of Doosan's own branded lineup of excavators, wheel loaders, articulated dump trucks, and the various attachments for those machines. Interestingly enough, Doosan is is exploring the possibility of selling off the Doosan Infracore subsidiary while keeping the Bobcat lineup of equipment inside Doosan. Essentially, the company wants to sell off its own brand of construction equipment while keeping its prized possession, a 51% stake in Bobcat. So why is Doosan doing this? Well, according to the Korea Times, it's all an effort to salvage yet another subsidiary of the company, and that is Doosan Heavy Industries and Construction. Doosan acquired that company in 2001, and it provides power generation, and it acts as a contractor providing engineering and construction services services in the company's home country of South Korea. The big problem here is that that heavy industries and construction unit is $3.48 billion in debt, according to the Korea Times. Even so, Doosan wants to hang on to that business. The sale of Infracore minus Bobcat would reportedly go toward funding the repayment of the heavy industries division's debt. And according to the report, despite Doosan's very real interest in pursuing a sale of the Infracore division minus Bobcat, the plan has met resistance from the company's creditors. The Korea Times reports that Bobcat accounts for about 63% of the Doosan Infracore division's total profitability. So the creditors see this as an opportunity to make a good bit of money by selling Bobcat rather than the other way around. However, according to that report, it's that profitability and momentum and all the excitement within Doosan that actually has Doosan wanting to hang on to Bobcat despite everything else because the company sees even further growth opportunity in the brand. So it's gonna be really interesting to see how this one plays out. Up next today on The Dirt is Dennis Howard. Now, as we said before, Dennis is the vice president at heavy equipment dealer RDO Equipment based out of North Dakota. Now, RDO is a dealer for John Deere and Vermeer machines, but also Topcon technology. Now, I'm gonna bow out for this interview because it was actually conducted by our editorial director, Marsha Doyle, who talked with Dennis over Zoom. And during the course of their conversation, they talk about not only the ways that the coronavirus pandemic has impacted the construction industry, but also how the pandemic has impacted the demand for heavy equipment and used equipment prices. Dennis provides some really great insight into equipment demand. And one of the things that he goes into is actually something that has been kind of lost in the shuffle due to all the news surrounding the coronavirus. And that is the drop off in construction activity and equipment demand due to the fall off in the oil industry. However, despite the pandemic and despite the negative impacts from oil, Dennis has a positive outlook for both construction and heavy equipment. Here's Marsha and Dennis. Then the you know the pandemic quit hit, and then the price of oil dropped, and it kind of became the perfect the perfect storm to have a really good year. And then it became a who knows year. So what we saw was an immediate drop. You know, if you take um, probably the April first was probably the low point. We saw an immediate drop. Everything kind of pulled back, and that was the the COVID, and then and then oil hit right after that. So those were the two main factors that really are affecting it right now. Those uh, those two factors, I would say, plus the a lot of excess equipment because everybody thought it was going to be a really strong rental year, so we're going to need more equipment. So the whole the whole market is is primed for a strong strong year, and then you have a, any downturn at all that affects it. 
So what has that done to availability, um, demand and supply, the usual demand and supply and uh, pricing on used to so in Yeah, so if I go back to that, uh, you know, that April 1st date, and I'll, I'll probably just keep referring back to that. I mean, in that time frame, 10 days either way, uh, we saw an immediate, we saw a drop. I mean, used equipment values uh, dropped sharply. The demand dropped sharply. The the people that buy that are truly in the used equipment business, not not like an RDO that has a used equipment division within its within its big uh, new division, but somebody that really buy and sell used equipment for a living. Those folks, and they shut off their buying. They just stopped. So they, they looked at different inventories, they looked at smaller inventories, they looked at smaller price points. We saw an immediate, just turn the valve off. Everybody kind of stopped. Um, and then and since then, we've seen it come back and it's been coming back fairly rapidly. Uh, and so we think we're gonna be fine. You can, you can almost watch, because we have a large footprint, you can almost watch as the states start opening up the equipment discussions in those markets start happening right right with that so we're not we're not where we were but we're definitely trending very quickly in the right direction not only from a demand standpoint from a value standpoint on a on a true used equipment discussion now i think you know one of the things about used equipment you got to look at is you got to look at you know we're talking late and low which is two thousand hours or less with warranty or are we talking six eight thousand hours or more that late and low never really saw the hit. And right now, I would tell you that late and low is maybe a little higher than we thought it would be at this time of the year, um, six months ago. It, it's really strong. And, and uh, it seems that a lot of people are transitioning their buying patterns from new to that, that type of used equipment. Okay. You mentioned something that I wanted to go back to, the fact that RDO is quite a large footprint and you cover several states. Uh, what are the differences that, that you're seeing in each of those markets? What are some of the changes in each of those locations and states? So the uh, where we have oil fields, uh, Northern Dakota, the Western half of North Dakota and Texas, the oil fields or the equipment demands dropped off dramatically. Um, the, the what you would expect to see in the oil field, the mid-size excavators, the 850 size dozers, those are, are demands dropped off dramatically. Now we're seeing those tractors come into the major markets and being consumed. We don't know how much of them will be, but we're seeing that. Pipeline's still strong, so we're still seeing a demand for the equipment in the pipeline part of those areas. But just a true uh, roust about taking care of the rigs, that kind of stuff. That that's that's falling off dramatically. Generators. We do a little bit of aerial in the in the northeast that or in the North Dakota area. That's really dropped off a lot too. Um, so that's kind of what you're seeing in the oil field. The major metropolitan areas, uh, you know, the Dallases, the Phoenixes, the you know, they, they all dropped immediately, but then they've all they've all come right back. So people are still working. There are a lot of jobs. Uh, so we're really not seeing the, the the news is worse. If you watch the news and then talk to five contractors, you're going to feel a lot better after you talk to five contractors. <laughs> you are watching the news because <laughs> most people are positive they've got work. It's it's uh, the story out there is better on the street than it is uh, you know, from watching the news. You know, when I've been talking to contractors and our editors have been talking to contractors. Uh, especially this spring, the immediate worry was not so much their present backlog, but what their backlog would look like in four or five months. Are you getting some of that with your uh, contractor customers? The exact same story. The, the concern that I'm getting is the, the people in the offices, the people that, that wrote the projects and, and did the plans, did everything they needed for six to eight months out weren't working for a few months. So there is going to be a point where we're going to see that. And I think what the funding does, you know, are people going to, are people going to pull back and not put money out for projects is still yet to be determined, but definitely the, the people that were bidding jobs, uh, engineering jobs. I mean, there was a disruption there, which we're going to see in the future. That's not an immediate deal. It's going to take several months for see what that is. Are there any um, types of equipment that are, um, 
moving better, um, having uh, better prices than other types of equipment? What What's hot right now is, I guess, what I'm asking. Well, yeah. So that's a, you know, the, what's hot right now is the, the late, the late model, low hour stuff. I mean, the, the under 2000 hour stuff is really doesn't matter what it is. It's hot. Now the, the midsize excavators aren't as hot as, um, you know, a, a large excavator, you know, a hundred thousand pound excavator right now is extremely hot. Uh, and, um, a late model one is bringing a premium, a true premium for the midsize arm, but anything, a late model, low hour is really, is really holding its value and, and the values are coming up quickly. Um, yeah, as far as the just the, the particular units, you know, like I said, the hundred thousand pound excavators are, are seem to be in very high demand. The larger excavators, uh, but there's not a yeah, I wouldn't say there's anything that's really really hot. Or you know, if you're asking the other question, what's really cold from what we see, and we don't do a lot in aerial, but the aerial business from what we can see is is really really bad. We have a small fleet of aerial, but. Um, from what we're seeing from the values, talking to other people that are truly in that business, if that's that business is really bad right now. Mm -hmm. so. Now you said you're saying the demand is there. What about the pricing? Is the pricing held up? On the on the the later model, the late the low and late stuff. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. The pricing is is great. The demand is good. I mean, it, it's really um, that segment is is really bright. If the if I look at our overall business, there's two bright segments in the equipment sales. One of them is that low hour late model tractor. The other one is the compact construction equipment, the small stuff. Even the new stuff on the small stuff is selling, selling strong. That used market's a little more challenging because um, the values of those types of units drop fairly quickly. But uh, yeah, on the uh, compact construction on new and the late and low model on the used is really strong right now. You were talking about the stop that occurred like April 1st uh, in the industry. And of course, some of that stop was uh, in the new manufacturing side of things. Um, has that uh, impacted used equipment sales at all? Um, or is that some something that you think might be a factor later on down? Yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting question because I don't, I don't think it's affected used equipment today. I think because people are trying to find the late model, low hour stuff they can buy today, it is affecting people buying new. Uh, I do think in the next six to 12 months, we're truly going to feel the impact of factories because right now even factories aren't fully, aren't fully operational. I mean, the, uh, you know, they're, they have issues where they're having to shut them down for weeks at a time or they get supply chain issues or, our dealers are conservative. I mean, when you've got everybody being conservative, by the time that the end user is conservative, the, the secondary buyer is conservative, the dealer is conservative, by the time that gets to the factory, orders just aren't there. So I, I don't know, and you know, I'm not going to tell you that I have visibility to what every factory is building, but from what I talk to people around the industry, it doesn't feel like uh, factories are anywhere close to where they need to be for supply of the market. So if the jobs hold, which is which is an F, but I think they will. We're going to see a a equipment demand over the next six to nine months, and where we'll see use values continue to rise. I I think the late model, low hour stuff is going to be is going to bring a premium. I think it's going to continue to rise. It won't rise a whole lot more, but I think the the values will hold for this entire year, provided we don't have another major whatever. Yeah, I think I heard you say earlier that people are opting to buy low hour used uh, instead of new is, is, did, was I correct in hearing that? Yep, Could you go into that uh, a little bit and discuss that a little bit? Yeah. What we're seeing is, so first off your bigger companies, your big, uh, your big uh, wall street type companies, if you will, they, they've shut down buying. I mean, they, they, they pulled way back. So that's, that's affecting the factories, but also your medium sized contractor that typically would buy, new is looking at, you know, can I get a good deal on a thousand hour, 1500 hour tractor? And that's what we're seeing them go to is buy, buy those tractors. And we're seeing that not only through our, our distribution channel, but I mean, and we watch, we watch all the auction companies. We talk to people all over the country. I've got a, and maybe I should have explained it at the beginning. I've also got a sales force that just sells used equipment for me across the country. So 
I've got a team that values it, then I've got a team that sells it. So our stories, we're always aligning our stories. And, and uh, yeah, we're seeing that across the country where people are they're looking for that deal. Uh, and, and, uh, and if they want a new one right now, I mean, some, some of the availability because of what you talked about with the factories were shut down. Some of that availability is out till fall now. So if you need a, if you're in the, the upper Midwest where the, the sun's shining, it's time to go to work and you need a tractor, you don't have time to wait for the factory to get you a new one. You're buying a late model low hour tractor and that's driving up demand quite, quite sharply right now. Okay, what's your crystal ball? What do you think is going to happen for the, the rest of this year on used equipment demand and pricing, um, supply, the, the whole ball of wax? What do you see happening? I want to hear yeah. your words of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I have any, uh, any great words of wisdom. I, I think the, I, I think the, the late model low hour stuff is continuing to be strong. I think it's going to be strong all year. I, I, I do believe jobs are going to hold from talking to contractors. So I think the rental demand is going to pick up. And as the rental demand picks up, more of the equipment in the market will be consumed either in rental or people buying because they don't want to rent or RPOs or whatever that is. Um, so I think my, my, I think my crystal ball would be is that the used equipment prices have seen their low point for the year and they're going to start climbing. You know, it's an election year. And any time you're in an election year, it's all bets are off you know, and, and by the uh, early fall. So I, I don't know, you know, in September, what's going to, what it's going to look like, but I really think the jobs will keep going. I think the equipment values will, will keep rising. The, the older used equipment, the six, seven, 8,000 hour stuff, which we really haven't talked about much is uh, those values are depressed. The, the forced liquidation of those values is really depressed. I don't know that that's going to come back anytime soon because a lot of that's more of a speculative buy or an out of the country play or there's a lot of factors in that, that I don't see a lot of energy around those prices coming back. And I think the, the quality stuff that you can put on a job, go to work, go to work and, and produce is going to, is going to continue to come back and it's going to hold strong. I, and I'm, what I'm hearing from you is that there's um, a general health in your client base uh, is there a segment that has gone to force liquidations? Is there some uh, fragment in there that is is had to go to that route to to get some cash flow in their businesses? It, it's you know the oil field, and we talked about it a little bit. We're seeing the oil field start to come to that. We're seeing the old machines now. It, it's it's interesting. And we're seeing we're seeing more of the pickups and more of that kind of stuff out of the oil field immediately going to force liquidation, but we we do we are starting to see the oil field tractors now starting to show up. So we're seeing a lot of those, and and that's where that that 200 size excavator, that uh, 850 dozer is really going to be at risk when all of those truly go into force liquidation. So we're seeing that there's going to be a lot of these smaller oil companies, service companies for the oil field that just aren't going to make it. So you're going to see a lot of that gear. Uh, end up places. Then the question is, is, can it be consumed in, into rental operations or major metropolitan areas? Can it, can it go into the pipeline areas? You know, where's all that gear going to end up at? And there's going to be a substantial part of it in the, in the force liquidation model. It's just going to have to. So. Is there anything happening in overseas markets that you see um, that, would have a significant impact on the North American market? No, not really. You know, the, the one thing that, that we've got to figure out as a North American market is we've gone to final tier four tractors, the, you know, tier three tractors when, when interim four and final four were coming out, tier three tractors were flying out of the States because everybody wanted them. Uh, you know, now we've got a lot of tier four tractors, interim four, final four tractors, five, six, 8,000 hour tractors, there's that natural secondary flow of the market isn't there anymore. We're going to have to figure that out. And uh, I've, I've said it for a while now that once we hit the a downturn, we're going to feel that pressure point. And I think we're feeling it now. And I think the manufacturers are going to have to, are going to have to find a solution around that, or that's going to be a, that's going to be a problem. You know, a lot more contractors are leasing, a lot more contractors are trying to get that you know, that first half of the life of the tractor and they're trying to find a way to 
pay the least amount for that. Well, when the second half of the life continues to drop in value, they have to pay more for that first half. So it's a it's a natural problem that we're going to face if we don't find a way to stretch the, the acquisition cost all the way through the life in a more more uniform unified flow. I guess you would say. Mm-hmm. What would be some of the solutions that you might think um, the industry should look at for for that situation? You know, it's we need to understand how to take a tractor from a final tier four back to a tier three, and we need to also understand, um, you know, so so right now, and I've been told it's a federal regulation. I'm not an expert on this, but I've been told you can't do that in a in a uh, anywhere in the United States borders. Yeah. So, like for us to take a, a John Deere tractor and detour it to send it to Mexico. I mean, I'm talking to you from Texas right now and send it to Mexico, I've got to send it to Mexico and then get it detiered. If they would, you know, there's, there's free trade zones, there's all kinds of things at airports, on borders, where, where equipment sets while the government doesn't let it in the United States, but it's not out of the United States. I think if the government would look at that and say, okay, in these areas, we're going to allow these tractors to set, we're going to make you put GPS on them. If you run them for too many hours, we're going to find you. There's a way to regulate that with the technology today to allow us to send tractors to a port in, in Laredo, detour it, and then ship it across into Mexico or mm-hmm. anywhere. And I think that's the solution. And I think we're going to have to be more open-minded as a, as a country on how we do that. And I, I think that's the, the technology to detour it, from what I understand, exists. Mm-hmm. It's just where to do it at in, in the – and that, to me, that's the gap. Yeah, and unfortunately, there's still a cost to, to deterring too that needs to be part of the transaction too. Yeah, well, there is, and that's that's the one of the bigger problems about sending it to Mexico because we've got partners in Mexico that would be glad to do it for us, but it gets down there, we spend the money, we get it done. Now that there's no market for it, well, we can't get it back with all the regulations going back and forth across the border. So uh, we we. We, we have too much at risk to do that. So, uh, but if it could sit somewhere where we knew what our cost was, we knew what it was going to be. We could have people from other countries come inspect it there. I mean, there's a lot we could do if we had a little bit of freedom on, on being able to change these tractors to a marketable state from a, into another country and do that in the United States, not in that country. Well, I think I'm the end of my question. Is there anything else that you'd, that you'd like to mention that I, I haven't asked you? I always like to have an open-ended question at the end of an interview. <laughs> it's I an open mic funny. time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I enjoy, the, I enjoy the conversation. You know, the, the used equipment business, it used to be a simple business that's getting more and more complicated with the, the difference in the tiers of engines and the and the, the large number of tractors being leased and the rental company's influence on it. So it's a, it's changed a lot, but it's still a fun business. I, you know, I don't, I think the, the like I said, I think the market's going to be strong. It, it really, that's the, where the contractors are doing. If the contractors can stay busy, uh, used equipment markets is going to stay strong. If they start shutting down, it's, it's going to change it. I don't see that happening. I, I think, I think, a lot of people are trying to compare this time from an equipment perspective to 07, 08, 09, totally different environment, mm-hmm. totally different environment. So I, I think, uh, I think as the, the country opens back up and people go back to work and they become more comfortable, we're seeing it every day. People are people that two months ago when we talked to were not buying, you know, on speculative, you know, people that want to buy, people use equipment business that want to buy used equipment to put on their lot. They weren't buying two months ago. Now they're actively buying. We're seeing that more and more. So that is going to wrap it up for this week's episode of The Dirt. Thank you guys so much for watching. And don't forget, we want to hear what you guys think. We want your feedback. Let us know what you think of the news we discussed, including that possible sale of the Doosan InfraCore division, but also this conversation between Marsha and Dennis on the impact of coronavirus and the oil industry on heavy equipment demand and construction activity. Let us know what you think about those topics in the comments below. We love hearing from you guys. And if you like this video or found any of the information in it useful in any kind of way, please do us a favor and hit that like button below. It really helps our channel out. And if you want more videos on the latest in the construction industry, heavy equipment, trucks, and more, subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you're getting up to the minute alerts whenever we drop a new video. Thank you guys so much for watching again, and we will see you next time.